All right. So just general housekeeping. Um, unless you're asking a question, please just remember to keep yourself on mute. It's really easy to forget that. Um, and also remember to unmute yourself if you are asking a question. Um, we'll be giving some short breaks kind of interspersed um, for some questions and answers. But if you guys have a question and you don't, we don't find a good time to answer it, please hold on to it until the very end. We'll have a dedicated time just for Q&A. Um, and hopefully we're able to answer all your questions uh, before that point, but we're happy to answer any that you think of that we were not able to anticipate. All right, so real quick, we'll be talking, be introducing our uh, High Adventure staff team for this year, describing how High Adventure fits into your unit's program, describing the options that we've got, what kind of makes Makajuan High Adventure an excellent um, resource for your unit, um, and that includes attending the Makajuan Institute of Technology or MIT. Um, and then how to register, um, what financial assistance, assistance is available, what COVID-19 precautions we're taking, and then again, that dedicated time for questions and answers. All right, so we'll dive right into our introduction, starting with a Mr. Mark Antonucci. Hello, everybody. My name is Mark Antonucci, and I will be this year's Trek and Corps de Bois director. Um, I'm very excited to get things going this year, and this will be my fourth year with the High Adventure program here at Makajuan. And we are more excited than ever to have you guys all, or some of you, hopefully, at least returning to camp this summer, see some friendly faces in person for once. Yep. Next up, we've got Adam Hoflick. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you guys all again. I am the uh, council camping chair, and I'm, uh, I'm a previous um, high adventure manager of some sorts to Makajuan, and uh, I've also guided high adventure tracks for private companies uh, in the Midwest and across the country. Yeah, so our resident high adventure advisor, Mr. John Lelstrom, is also on the call. Um, and he's been having some some phone challenges, but uh, well, I'm here. Good, excellent. If you can hear me, my name is John Lilstrom. I I have the uh, um, the pleasure to be the high adventure advisor, um, making reservations and talking to groups. And I'll turn it over to Rory. Yeah. So many of you are familiar with me. I'm our council program director and also the reservation director for Macajuan. So I'm the puppet master behind the strings, helping make sure that all of our camp directors and trek directors and everybody else has all got all the support that they need. All right. So. All right, so I will get things started off. I just wanna talk about the importance of high adventure in your unit program. The high adventure is really the pinnacle of the scouting experience and the uh, next step for a lot of your scouts as they progress through the scouting program. What it does is that as your scouts age, it provides a new challenge for them to test the outdoor skills that you're teaching them at your unit campouts and at summer camp and put those skills to the test. It's also going to advance their leadership abilities because throughout a trek, the scouts have to put leadership to their test and work with each other to accomplish something that's more challenging than they fa uh, fo uh, face in their daily, daily lives. Um, on top of all that, it creates a freshness, a variety of, uh, of sorts that they don't get to experience at school or in the regular unit. Uh, personally, I come from a, a relatively large unit and we do a uh, Eagles Come Home meeting every year uh, actually, our, it was just uh, two weeks ago now, and every single time I go to one of our Eagle Come Home meetings and us Eagles start sharing our stories, 90% of our stories are come from high adventures and just the amazing time we had uh, in, uh, in Shawamuga National Forest, Northern Wisconsin, or in the Boundary Waters. We all have these crazy fun stories of um, when we accidentally – uh, almost killed Jeff Holflick with a flying rock at Philmont, or when uh, I almost made my scoutmaster, Mr. B, uh, strangle me for doing something that I shouldn't have been doing. Uh, but those are the fun stories where, and their learning experiences. So High Adventure definitely creates a lasting impression with your scouts and is a great way to keep your scouts engaged in the program. 
a lot of uh, our scouts in our unit would only stay active because they knew they had to prepare for the, the next summer's high adventure. And it was very exciting every year when we decided where we were going and what activities we will be doing. Uh, it was something we all looked forward to. And then we also looked forward to the training exercise to get prepared. Yep. So just kind of some of the skills and environment that you get to learn. All right. All right, so um, Makajwan High Adventure Base, sorry, <laughs> look, reviewing my notes real quick. Uh, we track all over the north woods of, of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and the Upper Peninsula. And um, our, our treks are true wilderness experiences in that um, we go to remote places and um, we're not, we don't necessarily have the same amount of program and um, staffed camps at all of our destinations because we're going to really, really remote, pristine areas. Um, so kayaking on the Apostle Islands is another really remote experience. We'll be able to get into that in a little bit. You can canoe the Boundary Waters, paddle on the Flambeau River and all of its tributaries, um, explore the headwaters of the Wisconsin River, sailing on Lake Superior, also in the Apostle Islands from a completely different perspective than you get at water level in a kayak. Um, follow the trail of the last ice age on the ice age trail. Test your metals on Isle Royale's copper rich rugged trails and prickle with excitement for the porkies. Um, so experience true wilderness with our Makaj One High Adventure Base. All right, so Apostle Islands National Lakeshore. Uh, National Lakeshore is actually hold the same kind of designator as National Park. They're kind of like one step below a national park. Uh, probably you probably all know that because Indiana Dunes was a National Lakeshore and has just been upgraded to a new national park uh, last year. The Apostle Islands is off the Bayfield Peninsula in uh, northwestern uh, Wisconsin, sticking up there into Lake Superior. Actually, one of the islands that makes up the Apostle Islands features the northernmost point of Wisconsin. Uh, it is a awesome place to go and take on Gichigumi uh, to paddle along the, uh, the lake and to island hop. Some of the cool features include lighthouses, sea caves like you can see in that picture there, uh, where you can actually paddle into the sea cave where your whole boat will disappear into the cave. Uh, one of my favorite stories from the Apostle Islands was when I was guiding there. I was guiding with uh, John Barkhausen, a uh, former West Camp director, if you guys remember him, and uh, John Lostrom's son, Eric. And Eric was on, uh, we were camping on the same island, but Eric was guiding one group, and he was on the far eastern tip of the island. And Johnny and I were uh, on the western tip of the island uh, guiding a different group. And at the same exact time, the same night, we both saw black bears on this island. Uh, Johnny and I were participating in a flag ceremony with our scouts that we were guiding, and a black bear through our flag ceremony. And at the same time, Eric was having a small campfire on the beach with his group, and a black bear disturbed their campfire. It wasn't until we regrouped back on the mainland and compared pictures and saw the timestamp that we realized those black bears were within seconds of each other. Um, so it's a very cool place, very good chance of seeing cool wildlife as well as other features. Uh, the, it is one of our more expensive treks because it, it uh, requires a outfitter. We use the Northwest Passage, which is based out of Wilmette, Illinois, which has uh, been a home to many uh, Makajwan alumni after they leave Makajwan. Uh, they run these uh, sea kayaking treks all week for, or for one week. You'll meet up in Bayfield with them. They'll outfit with you the uh, kayaks, teach you what you need to know, make you do wet exits so that way you can safely exit the kayak if you flip over and get you squared away for a great night on the islands. Are there any questions about the Apostle Islands while we're here? All right. Back to you, Roy. All right. Um. Uh, yeah, I forgot that I had those on there. 
Um, all right, so John, take it away with our Boundary Waters track. Okay, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? I'm having some technical difficulties. We can hear you all right. All right, fantastic. That's one of the things about living close to Makajwan. It's great to be here, but uh, sometimes that little squirrel that lives in the tree that powers my internet gets uh, cold or tired. And um, <laughs> we have a little difficulty connecting. But um, to talk about the BWCA trip, um, it's uh, basically what we're talking about is a world-class wilderness camping uh, canoe trip. Um, BWCA has over 4 million or over a million acres um, 1,200 miles of canoe trails. Uh, we use an outfitter up up on the Gunflint Trail. Uh, it's one of our um, treks that starts on Saturday, the day before the regular camping uh, program. And we uh, um, spend the, the first day doing our overall shakedown and prep and on uh, Sunday, uh, when everybody else is coming into camp, we get together and uh, take off and go up to our outfitter at the Boundary Waters and uh, spend the evening getting our gear taken care of. It's about a seven and a half, eight hour drive up to uh, the tip of the Gunflint Trail, uh, where we spend that night in, a, in an Adirondack and get our, get our gear set and ready to go for um, the following morning. Um, one of the things about this trek is it's where a lot of the treks were kind of flexible on how we put together our, um, our trip plans. We need to really make a lot of advanced um, planning with this particular trek. So we, we talked to the people that are, are, are on the trek uh, and basically put together um a trip based on the um, experience and the needs and desires of the individual group. So then um, we get right into the, um, um, right out on the water on Monday, then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday morning on the water. Um, generally speaking, we do um, a trip every day instead of, base camping uh, unless we have a very inexperienced group um, and the outfitter will then pick us up on Friday, bring us back to um, their Adirondack uh, where we have a nice dinner and uh, showers after being out for that amount of time. Um, and then we uh, spend the night there and then head back to Makajuan on, on Saturday. Um, any questions, overall questions on uh, the BWCA truck? John, when would you recommend people um, as kind of a last time that they would be able to sign up for it? When would you when would you recommend people sign up by? Uh, it's one of those where um, we have a little bit of flexibility because we can move. Um, the way the Boundary Waters works is uh, you don't have specific campsite reservations like we have in a lot of our other facilities. Um, it's basically a, um, an entry point. So right now, uh, the entry points uh, are going to start um, being assigned the 1st of February. Um, but we have pretty much, well, we, we can, we have some flexibility all the way through February into March to get exactly what you want. Um, and then if maybe if you were to decide, well, even in April or May, we might be able to, to find an entry point. Um, the, the problem with wait, waiting that long is it may not be um, an entry point that you want. I mean, that, that would be more convenient to me. You may have to have, um, you have to drive a little bit more or do a few more portages uh, on your route. But uh, I would recommend that we get things in, well, let's say, let's say in February. That would probably be the best overall. Hey, John, this is Tom McFadden. I was just wondering how early uh, you would recommend 
group would do whatever training they're going to do before going on a trek like that? I think they should, um, um, again, we can tailor the, the distance um, to the individual group experience. Um, but I think they ought to, you know, spend um, a, a weekend at least, uh, if not two weekends out um, canoeing and maybe one, one weekend where they're, where they're out with uh, canoe camping, um, which you can, you can find down your way or, or basically just working to where you have your gear out and, and kind of like simulating uh, getting your gear together, putting it in the canoe, taking it out, that type of thing. So, Hey, John, um, can I jump in real quick? Uh, this is sure. Steve Brasner from True 56. With regards to the question that's on the table, that was an experience that I had um, on my high adventure trip with my unit. And uh, for us, we were fortunate because we do go up to Makajwan for our summer camp. And what we, our, our trip was after our summer camp week. And we had kids going on, scouts going on both summer camp and high adventure three weeks later. What we did is we talked with um, the aquatic staff and we set up some extra time in aquatics to practice some canoes strokes. We did take um, a couple of nights. We did bring scouts over there and we ported canoes back from aquatics to our campsites and back in the morning to give them practice of long distance portaging. And we also did some portaging at home. We uh, had some old uh, heavy aluminum canoes and we were walking them up and down some urban uh, streets here in St. Charles and uh, giving them a little bit of a taste of what it would expect. Um, it was a lot harder with the heavy aluminum canoes. So we were pleasantly surprised that it was a little bit lighter with the canoes up there. But um, we did uh, consider a couple of options working with Makajuan while we were up at camp. Hope that helps. Cool. All right. Our next trek is our Flambeau River Canoe Trek. OK, Flambeau. Um, I just got him kind of working blind here. Are you, do you have my, um, my PowerPoint why. up? Yep. Rory? Yeah, I do. Okay. I don't know why the picture showed up really, but. <laughs> so basically the Flambeau Trek is one of our oldest, uh, treks. We started that oh, back in the early seventies. Um, the, uh, the Flambeau, Turtle Flambeau Scenic Waters area is about 40,000 acres of rugged forest, undisturbed shoreline, um, flowage area, which is basically, for those of you who don't know, a flowage is a dammed up a lake that's created by a dammed up river. Um, anyway, it's one of our more flexible programs. Uh, you can start and basically go in at the, um, on the Manitowish River or the Bear River, or you can start right, right on the, um, on the Turtle Flambeau Flowage. Um, it's one of our programs that starts on Sunday, same as our, um, our other, our, our normal camp program. Um, it's one of those that is, um, can be geared toward very basic canoeists and then also um, people that want to get out and, and paddle a lot. Um, the Flambeau is also kind of, for me, I, I spend a lot of time in the Flambeau personally. It's, uh, it's a world-class fishing uh, area for walleye and muskie and um, smallmouth bass. So we encourage people that go on those treks to, um, to fish if they would like to and, and be prepared with uh, fishing tackle and you know, work it so that they might get a, a night of uh, a dinner with fresh fish. Um, also, from a wildlife standpoint, we see a lot of uh, uh, basic, you know, the, the basic wildlife you see uh, kind of at Makajuan, the eagle, I think we may have lost John. Up in the Flambeau is uh, at night we'll hear wolves howling. And um, one, the other one of the things is that we'll, we'll hear a lot of uh, sandhill cranes and see a lot of them in that area as well. 
Um, basically, what we'll do is um, we get into the high adventure base on Sunday, do our shakedown and prep, and then go right into the um, flambeau on Monday morning at one of those uh, one of the checkpoints that we've decided uh, the one of the landings and spend uh, a day or maybe two on the river and then a couple of days paddling through the the turtle flambeau flowage. Uh, and then the last day on Friday, um, if the group is up to it, um, we portage the, the turtle flambeau dam and then um, paddle down the flambeau river for about four, four and a half hours, <laughs> depending on how many times you um, have to pull over to get the water out of your canoe. There are several sets of class two rapids um, from the dam down to where we, we pull people out on agenda landing just north of uh, Park Fall. Yeah. Any questions, additions? I think everybody everybody on our staff here has been on, on that trek uh, at least once and many of you several times. Cool. All right. Moving on to our Wisconsin River headwaters. Wisconsin Headwaters is one that we started about five years ago. Um, we were wanting to develop more of our programs uh, close into camp. Um, again, that starts on Sunday uh, where we um, go through our, our normal shakedown program and then uh, go up to an outfitter that we use north of Conover, Wisconsin, which is uh, very close to the Wisconsin-Michigan border. Um, we kind of set up camp there at uh, a campground of the outfitter on Monday, um, get everything set. And then on Tuesday morning, we bus up to basically the headwaters of the Wisconsin river. I don't know if a lot of, you know, the size of the Wisconsin river, you cross it a couple of times when you're on your way to camp and it's quite large, but, uh, we put in at an area where it's kind of like skids Creek. Um, coming down into uh, Lake Killian. It's a very narrow, um, small river. And then we paddle 10 to 12 miles down to the campground where we set up camp and then um, spend the night again at the Outfitters. And uh, the following day, we break camp, um, pack all our gear in the canoes, and then go down uh, three days uh, downstream on the uh, on the uh, Wisconsin River. Did and I say flambeau? I'm sorry. I'm... Yeah, no, I, I apologize for the slides. There's a, I had some mix up in which versions of the file I had and apparently they got crossed. So some of the flambeau and Wisconsin River stuff is mixed up, but I'll make sure that's fixed before we, before I send that out to everybody. <laughs> this is the headwaters of the Wisconsin River, not yeah, the flambeau. Yeah, Wisconsin River headwaters. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> sorry, I'm 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 flying blind because I'm just using my phone here because I I can't get I can't get hooked into the into the Zoom meeting. But um, this is a, a a trip that it's pretty much all flat water except we do have um, a Friday uh, alternative program where we can um, do an inflatable kayak trip down the Ontonagon River, which is really cool. Um, it's not, not far north of, of Pond over there. And, um, at the end of the day, pack up, get back to camp on Friday night um, for our, our campfire and our evening programs. And if there's an away ceremony, we try and get back in time for that on Friday night as well, because it's one of our, our programs that's closer into camp. Um, just any questions on that specific program? Okay. Um, just in general, um, you know, a lot of people ask about, you know, which program is designed for the beginner and which program is designed for the more advanced um, older scout. The way I look at these is we really have the opportunity to tailor a lot of these water programs to 
either very um, novice canoeists or we can ramp them up to be a good trek for, for even more experienced canoeists. So um, with the, and that's basically the Wisconsin River Trek and the Flambeau. Um, Boundary Waters is a little bit more of, um, oh, I wouldn't say advanced trek, but it's one that um, we really need to, to have people that have spent some time in the canoe before. Cool. Thank you very much, John. All right. Whoa. Ice Age National Scenic Trail. So uh, one of the closest treks that we offer to Makajuan um, is the Ice Age National Scenic Trail. Um, it's a five-day backpacking trip um, that covers a couple sections of the Ice Age Trail that are uh, literally in Makajuan's backyard. I think they're like 15 miles away from camp, so it's definitely the shortest travel time. Um, so the Ice Age Trail, if you're unfamiliar with it, is the is a 1,200-mile long footpath cutting across the state of Wisconsin that follows the terminal moraine of the, the glaciers from the last ice age. And um, that picture below is one that I took with, I think, Troop 4150 or Crew 150 on one of their backpacking trips a couple of years ago. Um, so the trail, as close to civilization as it may be in terms of you're probably no more than five, 10 miles from a road at any given point, um, you still really feel like you are out in, out like in the, in a really primitive natural area. Um, and the trail itself makes you feel that way as well. So it's a really, really neat opportunity to, to get to one of the lesser known parts of the Ice Age Trail as well. Um, it's great for all skill levels, um, again. Um, and this one, the typical timeline for it is you'll show up on Sunday and you'll go through the normal kind of shakedown and gear prep. And then Monday morning, um, You'll head right to the trailhead, get dropped off, and start on your trail right, right there. Usually before 11 a.m. on Monday, you're on the trail moving. Um, and you'll get to just keep on pushing and pushing until you get to your uh, final uh, endpoint where you can get picked up. All right. So, oh yeah, and there's the timeline. Um, and one of the other nice things with the Ice Age Trail is that you'll, you'll be able to get back to camp early enough that you'd be able to um, schedule an afternoon program on Friday, whether that's horseback riding, if you want to go mountain biking, or if you just want to like relax on the water, um, we'll be able to figure something out for you to do back at camp um, before dinner and before any OA ceremonies if you're doing this in one of the odd weeks. All right. So our Lake Superior sailing trip, this quickly became one of our more popular ones. Um, this is another one that's up in the Apostle Islands. And as mentioned before, you get to have a really, really cool, unique um, perspective on the, the Apostles um, by sailboat. So we partner with the marina up there and they provide the US Coast Guard certified um, skippers for each of the boats. Each of the boat is each of the um, sailboats are equipped with um, galleys, refrigeration, usually they have grills and they'll have opportunities for you to go off and explore all of the islands that you're going to be sailing through. Um, so you get to have a little bit nicer food. It's almost like car camping, except you get to float on the water and get rocked to sleep every night. Um, and yeah, it's pretty neat. I, this is one of the treks that I haven't personally been able to get onto yet, uh, but I, I'm, I very much would like to as soon as I can. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, and I think it, it should be in a different part of the Apostles as well. They're in different parts of the island chain. Um, from logistics, uh, each ship is crewed up to six people. Um, the specific kind of breakdown of, of why is up on makajwan.com slash high adventure, uh, but it's, there's only room for seven people on the, on the boat, and one of those is uh, reserved for the captain. Um, all right, Mark, do you want to take it away with yeah, Rory? Right. Yeah, I have been on the uh, the sailing trip. You want me to talk about it for a minute? Yeah, absolutely. I'll go back to yeah. That. So I actually my my troop had the honor of being the very first troop to to take this trip, which was cool. Yes, I remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had a good time. 
uh, we were blazing a trail for everyone else. But the the important thing was that the it, we found out about the second day that our skipper actually was an Eagle Scout, which was real, real cool. And his his attitude was, you know what? I don't want to have to touch the wheel the whole time. You guys are going to run the boat. And I'll just supervise. Now, it turns out he actually did run the wheel. Um, he dropped us off on an island. There was really nowhere to dock. So he had to kind of come up to the dock. We all jump off. And then he took it back out because there was nowhere to anchor it and just kind of went in circles out there for a while. Anyway, um, but it was it was a great trip. Uh, we got to find out who knew how to drive because some of the boys driving the uh, the boat had no clue what they're doing. Um, and the other nice thing is you pretty much you sit down and and I mean he's the captain is going to be realistic with you about what you can and can't do in a, in the days you got. But you get to plan your own trip. You know what part of the Apostle Islands? What do you want to see? You want to see lighthouses? You want to camp on beaches, you can stay on the boat, you can camp on the shore, it's up to you. Um, they're pretty flexible on that. Cool. Thank you, Chuck. Yep. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, Isle Royale, another Lake Superior adventure. Yes. So as you can see, I have it labeled as the beautiful hidden world in the North Woods. I have to be honest, I was a little selfish when we uh, divided up the different treks and who was going to talk about what because this trek and the next one are my absolute favorites. Um, I'm a backpacker and I Royale and the Porcupine Mountains are two just absolutely amazing backpacking trips. Uh, I actually go to school here in Missoula, Montana, where I get a, the chance to do a lot of great backpacking. Um, but it is a different world out there in the beautiful North Woods. And I will explain to you exactly why I love it. So IRL is a fantastic and, and beautiful hidden gem. It's um, if you go to the very utmost point of the upper peninsula of Michigan, the highest that you can go, um, you actually take a ferry from there from a place called Copper Harbor. And it is a five hour ferry ride um, from mainland Mich Michigan from the UP up to the island of IRL. So Isle Royale is actually the fourth largest lake island in the world. Um, cool little fact there. And it's it's 206.73 um, square miles of perfectly preserved um, national wilderness area. It actually na it has national park designation. Um, one really, really great thing about Isle Royale is the wildlife there. The wildlife is absolutely stunning and beautiful. One really cool note about it is that every winter, an ice bridge actually forms from Thunder Bay, Canada, which is a, a few hours north of I the island of Isle Royale. And it forms from Thunder Bay, Canada to Isle Royale. And during that time, it allows animals to migrate over to the island. But one great little thing about that ice bridge is that bears are hibernating during the winter. So there are absolutely no bears on the island. Um, the only predators on the island, or the only large predators on the island are their very small wolf population. Um, and what's great about that, it has allowed the moose population on the island to absolutely flourish. So as, whereas moose are mostly gone from anywhere in the North Woods at this point, there's a really large population density of moose on the island of Isle Royale. So you see them all the time. Um, and well, if you're lucky to see them, they're, they're elusive creatures, um, but I've been lucky enough to spot a couple on my trips, um, which is an absolutely just breathtaking experience. Um, so on IRL, you have the chance to spend your week um, backpacking on the beautiful, um, through the beautiful interior lakes and on the shoreline of Lake Superior, which let me tell you, after a long day of backpacking in the summer heat, Lake Superior and its refreshing coldness is absolutely wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's uh, that is what we have for IRL, Rory. If you would like yeah. to, just uh, one this. one additional thing um, yes. about Isle Royale, we're uh, we're currently um, actually we've been contacted by the National Park Service in conjunction with um, uh, Michigan Tech. 
And um, what they want to do is get our input on putting together an environmental program, um, which would be kind of a semi-permanent environmental program that they would build on three different locations on the island, uh, the areas that are not designated as um, wilderness area. So um, we'll have our input on how to put together a week-long uh, environmental program. And um, I don't think we're going to be able to offer it this year yet, but um, for 2022, we will be offering, and we'll be one of the first to be able to offer a, a week-long environmental program uh, on our Royal. Yep, it's going to be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, really cool. <laughs> yeah. All right, um, on to the Porkies. All right, the Porcupine Mountains, which is, I would have to say, my second favorite trip out of all of them. Um, so as you see in the, the quote above, it's called Aldo Leopold described it as the great uncut in 1945. They actually, they came, if you look to the left of that picture, you'll see that cliffside. And this is a location called Lake of the Clouds. Um, and it's said that Al, uh, Aldo Leopold actually came upon this location and saw this beautiful expanse of untouched wilderness. Um, and he decided right there that he had to convince the state legislature um, to reserve this as a, a reserve this land um, and its natural splendor um, for the rest of the time to be. So in 1945, they dedicated 60,000 acres of wilderness, untouched wilderness area um, and made it into a Michigan State Park which it still holds that designation today. Um, Porcupine Mountains is an amazing, amazing combination of um, interior forest hiking combined with, again, that, that lakeshore um, hiking experience. So it's, let me tell you, it's a, it's a nice thing to, uh, to hike towards the lake because one thing lakes are great about is, is blowing wind that blows the mosquitoes away. So you'll always be looking forward to, uh, to heading towards those, those beautiful views on Lake Superior um, and towards that ice cold water. Um, there's 25 miles of lakeshore uh, that is included in the, the 60,000 acres of the Porcupine Mountains, and there's 90 miles of uh, rugged backcountry trails. So there's there's plenty of opportunities to to you know hit different spots within the state park, and to customize a trek for any skill level, um, and really just come to a true wilderness area. Once you get into the Porcupine Mountains, you rarely see other people, and it is truly a wilderness experience. Um, and it's about it's only about three hours north of our, our camp at Makajwan, so it's not um, too far of a, a journey right up to the to the upper peninsula of Michigan there, and right on the beautiful shore of, of Lake Superior. Yep, that's awesome. Um, any questions on Isle Royale or Porkies? One comment on the Porcupine Mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, many people have said that is a wonderful place to do a shakedown a year or two before a, a Philmont trek. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely correct. Um, it is really, really a great spot. There's a ton of opportunity to practice uh, elevation change um, within the state park, which is one of the reasons that it makes it such a great trek um, if you're preparing to go on some other high adventure treks and let's say in Philmont or other backpacking across the country, uh, being able to practice this, that elevation change in the Midwest is not something you get to do um, in every location. And that's one of the, one of the many reasons that makes uh, the Porcupine Mound such a beautiful place. Yeah. So we know the Porkies are special. Uh, Mark, I got a question for you. What makes Makajwan High Adventure so special? Oh, let me tell you about that, Rory. Um, so one of the first great things about Makajwan High Adventure specifically is it gives our scouts and us a chance to explore the natural beauty that's in our very own backyard. So there's there's not very much wilderness area left in the Midwest. And these are some of the most beautiful, pristine places that I have ever um, I have ever been to across the entire country. Um, I've, I've absolutely fallen in love with these areas. And it's really important to, to get our youth out into these locations that are that are close to home, not necessarily 
vacation destinations because it, it helps them create a, a meaningful connection with the environment around them, um, which has uh, so many positive benefits, not only for the individual, but also for our environment and our, and our world as a home or as a whole. Yeah, so we've, we've touched upon this point a couple a couple times throughout the presentation, but the Kajwan High Adventure is is absolutely fantastic for the different um, levels of skill set um, or the different level skill levels within a troop. Um, we can customize treks very specifically to what a troop is looking to accomplish, whatever goals that they have in mind, or just um, to make sure that everybody is comfortable. Or if you guys really want to go out and challenge yourselves, um, we can, you know, make our guides do that too with you. <laughs> Um, another great thing is uh, obviously we have um, a wide expanse of different skill sets that we can that we can go over during these treks. So whether it's a backpacking trek or canoeing trek, sailing or kayaking, there is a, a large plethora of different skill sets that we can make sure that we hit um, during those experiences. One of the great things, obviously, is you have the uh, ability to practice your leadership skills um, during these treks and. One fun thing about Makajuan is, is especially if you're preparing for a larger trek in the future, we have a lot more flexibility with our, our meal um, creation. So we really strive to make sure that we are providing um, not only fresh and nutritious food, but we're providing the scouts a chance to actually practice these backcountry cooking skills, which is actually not an experience that uh, you get on a lot of different high adventure tracks. A lot of, um, like, let's say if you go to Philmont, almost all of your food will be prepackaged or dehydrated. We try to stray away from that as much as possible, as much as uh, our weight thresholds allow, um, but to provide you guys with that, those, uh, those practicing those different skill sets. Um, yes, convenience and accessibility. That's also a, a very important part of um, the Makai Zerman experience. Obviously it, it, is, it is convenient that we are able to communicate with you guys on a one-to-one -one, um, level before your trek starts. Any questions you guys might have, we are more than happy and excited to talk about these trips with you guys. Um, we've been on these treks ourselves and we know just how actually life-changing um, they can be. Yes, okay. And then we have the Mikaja Magic, which I won't talk too much. We actually have a special guest here tonight that's gonna talk a little bit more um, about this. Um, Steve Brazza from Troop 56, but um, every trek that you go on, you have the chance to have a Mikaja One staff member with you. And these are actually usually our trek guides. Well, they have to be over 18 years old. So typically they are very seasoned and experienced staff members. And hopefully they're staff members that a lot of your scouts have had the chance to grow up with. Um, and it's a really great opportunity for your older scouts to, to interact with a um, staff member member that may be more wise or knowledgeable and and having that staff member with you brings that little bit of Makajuan magic into your trip with you instead of um, the adult leaders getting hashed that out for themselves. So we'll let Mr. Brazda talk here um, and share his ex his experiences that he's had with the Makajuan High Adventure program. Thank you, Mark. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, you took a little bit of magic for me on that, but um, I can attest to a lot of the conversation that was on this call. Um, my unit is uh, Troop 56. We are out in St. Charles, and we've had a relationship with Makajuan for over 20 years. Um, I was doing a little bit of uh, uh, checking. Uh, personally, I've been on two treks, Boundary Waters and Isle Royal, um, and when I got involved with High Adventures in my unit. Um, I'm aware of two other trips that um, our unit has taken uh, during my leadership in our scout troop, but my, my scouts were not of age yet, but they were on the Porkies and they also uh, did Apostle Island. Um, actually, Apostle Island, my older son was on, um, Boundary Waters and Isle Royal, my younger son was on. Um, they are both, uh, one, uh, my oldest son, Ryan, is uh, an Eagle Scout and is on staff. He'll be, I believe, in the Health Lodge uh, this year. My younger son, uh, Adam, he has uh, just finished up his Eagle project and hopefully he'll be finishing off the rest of that. So. Um, He'll be turning 18 uh, in advance of camp, and I think uh, he is uh, interviewing to be on staff as well for this coming year. But um, he's been on both the last two trips with me on the Boundary Waters. But I could speak um, specifically to the uh, the context of uh, taking a look at the size of your group, the experience of your group, um, size, meaning even height. Uh, my younger son, uh, Adam, 
uh, it was under 100 pounds and he was on the boundary waters. So, you know, there was a little bit of concern with uh, getting him prepared or getting ready for portaging and stuff like that on canoes. Um, in Isle Royal, um, he was still under five feet, barely under five feet uh, tall. And uh, what he was able to carry in a backpack was much different than some of our other scouts that were 6'2 uh, in size. So, um, you know, it, it, we there are ways to be able to accommodate that uh, in flexibility and working through that. Um, one of the advantages of working with Makajwan that I had found is I was never the the scout or the total outdoor guy. Um, I learned a lot of my skills through scouting, uh, through my experiences and going through training in the program, uh, wilderness uh, first aid training, et cetera. But I had never done that as a, as a scout. I used to do summer camp up in the Northern woods myself, about 10 minutes away from where Makajwan is at um, up in um, uh, Rylander. But uh, I never took a high adventure to that extent. So one of the uh, one of the values of working with Makajwan, obviously from our Eunice perspective, we already had the relationship and we knew many of the staffers that were there. Um, they also take some of the pressure off with regards to worrying about gear and some of the other equipment and peripheries where you're able to then concentrate just on getting your youth prepared for the trip and what you might need to do personally. Um, and that takes a load, a, a big load off of your, um, off your leadership, especially when I've noticed that over the last 10 years, um, a lot of the available time and effort to be able to do that, you've got a lot of dual working families in that and being able to plan uh, some of these high adventure trips, more the, the more complex ones, takes a lot of uh, time and effort off the leaders. And if uh, in this case here, Makajwan is able to do all that with their outfitters and work their magic on the backside, and you can concentrate on what, what matters most and make it enjoyable and preparedness for your scouts. Uh, the one thing that I also like to kind of call out is, you know, when we talk about scouting, scouting is all about the circle of life. It's kind of a pay it forward type concept. Um, I can speak from personal experience, the Makaja magic and the circle of life. Um, I, I've known of, uh, I know Adam Holflick did the Apostle Island trip with my older son, Ryan. And I know there's just some good uh, good jokes in, uh, about uh, towing a couple of canoe, uh, kayaks a, a couple of times on that trip. They had some uh, pretty high waves, but um, they did an awesome job on that trip. But um, for the Boundary Waters trip, I ended up working with a, a, uh, a guide, Brett Towell. Uh, my story or circle life on, on this from a scouting perspective is Brett Towell was a CIT at Makajuan and befriended my older son, Ryan, uh, at the time as a first year scout. I had no idea that, you know, eight, nine years later, I would be having a discussion with Pratel on a high adventure trip in Makajwan for a week and be able to reflect, um, you know, where our paths had intertwined. And I've seen him in and out of camp, you know, several years after that very first experience, but had no idea that I'd see him on a high adventure trip um, coming back. So um, for me, it was uh, very personal from a scout family perspective. Uh, a lot of the staffers have become my extended scout family because I've seen them. I'm Mark is nodding his head. I was with him on uh, the last trip up in Isle Royal, and we had a great time on that. Um, I can speak to, we did see a moose on that trip. Uh, uh, far end of a lake, but I was able to spot one. We were at the end of the pack and had the ability to kind of slow down a little bit to take some photos and, and catch some of the wildlife. But um, again, I guess I digress, but you know, the Makajuan magic is truly there. And I can't speak enough for the preparedness of the staff and the ability that the staff working with your youth. So a lot of it is leadership. When you talk about these high adventure, you're preparing your crew for leadership amongst themselves. Them having the visibility of the staff at Makajuan, which they, in our case, we already had familiarity with the staffers through the program over the years that added an extra quality from an adult leadership perspective that allows, uh, you know, gains the, uh, helps the crew members at Makajwan um, lead our crew and work with our scouts, but um, makes a connection there, but it kind of completes a full circle with, you know, the pay it forward part. You, know, you work through leadership within a scout unit by helping new scouts cross over. Um, hopefully, you know, there are some then that will start expanding the horizon and work on camp staffs um, and working in program areas. And then you got some that will take that a step further and go out into the high adventures. So, you know, this is just, one of one of the ways of working with a, a camp at Makajuan and and their high adventure program helps the uh, perpetuator or fuels that circle of um, circle of life with scouting. So, thank you very much, Mr. Raza. Not a problem. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. You're muted, Rory. Just so you know. <laughs>
There we go. Sorry. <laughs> um, so now we'll kind of get into the more nitty gritty stuff, which is how do you register um, and what kind of financial assistance is available for some of, or if you have anybody in your unit that may need it. Um, so in order to register, first steps is always going to be talking with your SPL, your crew president, or your ship's boat swing, and make sure that your unit's actually interested and your youth are actually interested in going on high adventure. Um, take a look at the trek destinations. Uh, there's trek planning guides up on makajwan.com um, under the resources page. Um, 2020s is up right now. I'll be having, I'll have 2021s up um, either Tuesday or Wednesday of this week. So it should be live by the time that this video actually gets posted for you guys to share out. Um, fill out the Trek request mm -hmm. form, also available on makajwan.com slash high adventure. Um, and, and mail that or um, email that to Debbie Geiger. And all the instructions for that are on the form. That's all step by step. Um, and make sure to include your deposit on it. And then Debbie will send you a password to do the online registration portion of it so that you can start getting your scouts signed up. Um, yeah. So, and similar to um, camping uh, for traditional scouts BSA camp stuff at Makajwan, um, you'll have a trek contact person, um, which is usually easiest to do as one of the adults going on the trip, uh, just to minimize that chain of communication. And, and, and then just to add something to what Rory is saying there, if, if yeah. you're if you have any questions on whether your group is um, oh, experienced enough, or if you want to uh, talk about one trek or another, um, I don't know if you per went at the beginning. I I really um, I'm basically the advisor in the winter where a lot of these guys are working. I'm retired. And so I've got the, the ability to uh, basically uh, field any questions that anybody may have. So uh, please feel free to email or call me at any time um, for advice on which track to pick or um, how to how to go about uh, putting the track together. Yeah, I can't. Uh, I can't uh, agree with John uh, more on that. He did a great job helping us. Um, the Boundary Water trip was one of was my first trip, and he was instrumental in in taking uh, some of my concerns uh, with uh, some of the younger scouts on that trip with us, and we actually had a great time. Yeah, set and, up. It set up really well. Yeah, and as as part of the registration and just asking us questions, part is. Um, we want to make sure that you guys are staying healthy and new, like getting all the food that you need and want on your trips. So we work to accommodate special diets and we want to make sure that the kids' dietary needs aren't necessarily a restriction with going out on a trek. Um, so whether that's a nut allergy, lactose intolerance, uh, vegetarian meals, um, really anything under the, the sun, as long as the, the parent and the, the scout themselves are, are comfortable with the diet and we'll work with people on that. Um, to make sure that we can make sure that everybody's getting food. <laughs> yeah. All right. So for our next one is financial assistance. So we have a very generous um, scouting community in NAIC that has funded um, a campership program that's available for NAIC scouts uh, to use on any of the treks below. Um, that can cover, there's a, a, an application online um, that is linked on um, the High Adventure page, or should be, and then also on um, our iHub under the Unit Resources page. And I'll include links to this in the um, uh, kind of the email that goes out once the video gets posted. I'll include a copy of the slides and any relevant links directly in the body of the email as well. Um, so there's an application that should be filled out by the family itself because it contains some personal and sensitive information. Um, but then it can cover any, either some of the trek or all of the trek, depending on what that family's individual circumstances are. So we want to make sure that your scouts can get out on high adventure as much as possible. And this campership program is also available for our resident camp for Scouts BSA. Corps de Bois program and also day camp and any any of the other summer camp programs that we offer. So yeah, please use it. All right. 
Now for the inevitable elephant in the room, um, COVID-19. Um, so we're coordinating with the Langley County Health Departments and we're um, working with the American Camp Association who has who contracted out a, a health and safety firm to write a COVID-19 camp operation manual along with the CDC. And we're implementing that for all of, all of camp and that's gonna extend to our TREK programs and making sure that our staff are healthy uh, making sure that you and all of your all of your youth are healthy before you get to camp. Um, so that's going to be more health screenings, temperature checks, and additional sanitation and hygiene items going out on treks and in camp as well. So it's I know that's kind of bigger, broader stuff, but again, it's we're still six months out from camp, so a lot can change, um, and we will keep adapting to the circumstances as they change because that's one of the keys to scouting is adapt, <laughs> improvise, adapt, and overcome. So, all right. And Lori, if I could just add a little something to that. Mm -hmm. So last summer, the summit managed to run in July and August. They managed to do this with a record number of people showing up for their, their summer camp-like program. And they had zero cases come out of that. So, you know, you follow what, what's recommended and everything, it does work. Yep. Yeah, so it, it won't, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're doing everything we can to make sure that everybody's safe um, for camp and our tracking program. All right, so um, if you guys have any questions, again, these will all be included out in a summary email and thank you for attending email that gets sent out later this week. Um, if you have any Trek specific questions, like what is this Trek and what, what should I know about this Trek, contact highadventure at makajuan.com. That'll email John uh, directly. If you have questions or need help registering for anything, whether that's High Adventure or otherwise, uh, email debbie.geiger at scouting.org. If you've got some general Makajuan questions, email me at reservation director at makajuan.com. That just kind of helps me keep my um, all of the other scouting duties that I have and my Makajuan stuff um, separated and I'll respond to you faster that way. <laughs> um, again, these will all be sent out as well. Um, if you guys have any, actually, I think Adam was going to kick us off with a couple questions that got messaged to him. So we'll open yeah. up the Q&A. First, I would like to echo what John said. If you guys have any questions about any of our treks or just about High Adventure in general, please do not hesitate to reach out to that High Adventure. Um, either Rory, Mark, or John, all three incredibly knowledgeable about the uh, High Adventure programs, and they can help steer you in the direction. Whether you are interested in doing a trek this year or if you come from a younger unit and you're interested in setting up a High Adventure down the road, they can help plan an activity for you guys to help get you prepared, whether it's like a mini high adventure overnight uh, that gets incorporated to your Makaj while stay or something you can do back home with your unit on your own. Uh, and, or if you're looking, your unit is looking to do their own thing. Again, all three are very uh, well knowledge and can help you um, form those plans. I did get a question uh, right away about the Apostle Islands. Uh, first, I did want to mention the Apostle Islands, I forgot to mention this earlier, uh, has a slightly older uh, age requirement than the rest of our trips. Uh, you have to be 14 years of age. Uh, that's because you're of the craft you're paddling and the extreme conditions on Lake Superior. Uh, the other great aspect, though, about the Apostle Islands is it is one of our larger trek groups. We can take up to 16 participants on the Apostle Islands, um, which is, I think, the highest... Uh, group size we offer. So uh, one of the, if you have a bigger group, great. Uh, that's a great program for you. Uh, Rory, would you like to answer uh, this question? Is the Corps de Bois taking place during week two? Uh, yeah, Corps de Bois will be taking place during week two with a special kind of flavor to it where it's gonna be um, geared much more towards the venturing program. So I'm talking with our Youth President of the Venturing Officers Association for NEIC, um, as well as the, the adults involved with that. And we're planning a venturing specific Corps de Bois. Um, I haven't been able to get more information about it, about it yet because we're still planning it, but it'll have um, some equestrian theme to it, 
shooting sports theme, paddling theme, fishing theme, all sorts of activities under those, that kind of umbrella um, and climbing as well. So each, each kind of portion of it's going to focus on a different part. Roy, did you just want to mention that um, during the next mug, mug club meeting, we'll be discussing Cordoba further as well? Oh yeah, and actually, yeah. So in March, we'll be talking about Corps de Bois specifically, um, along with some of the other kind of in-camp high adventure programs like the horse ranch climbing and all the other awesome fun stuff that we do. Um, yeah, so if you guys have, uh, if you guys want a kind of a information page to go to, I've mentioned it a couple times, we have our camp website, casual.com and there's, uh, we revamped it this past fall, and so it's a little bit easier to navigate. And if you just go under High Adventure, you can get all of our information for that. Um, our resource page has the Frequently Asked Questions, Camp Planning Guide, Health and Safety, and some other useful information on there. Uh, we did get a question about, uh, does every unit need to provide two adults? Uh, the short answer is yes. Yes, you must be able to provide two adults and follow youth leadership. Um, if your unit is struggling and cannot find a second adult, please do not take that as a hard no. You cannot come and do a truck with us. Uh, Rory has a great bench of, res of people he can call upon to help your unit. Uh, and whether it be a n adult leader who is also a Macajron staff member that summer uh, going with your already assigned guide, or it's a alumni or another scout leader from a different unit, uh, we'll find somebody who's interested and we can uh, help find uh, outfit you with a second adult to make that high adventure possible. Yep. I just want to speak to that. Uh, maybe one thing to add to that, um, if I understand it correctly, yeah, what Adam says is correct. Um, you need to have your 2D leadership as you're bringing your, your people to camp and and to the trek and back from the trek. But on the trek, um, we do provide a guide for those treks. So if you have, for example, two adults and one adult does not feel capable to go on that specific trek for some reason or, or another, um, our guide that goes with them will qualify as the second leader to complete too deep leadership. Do I have that correct? Yeah. Actually, okay. uh, or... too deep leadership now, every, all the, both adults have to be over 21. No, um, not all of our guides are over 21. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. in that case, in that case then. Okay. yeah, in that case, we would, we would try to um, obviously provide a guide that does meet that age threshold requirement. Um, but uh, okay. we're very flexible, um, so we'll work with we'll work with our groups and we'll make the the experience happen. I know we had one comment from uh, Mr. Wolfson. Would you like to to, to add something? No, it's really not a major statement. I, I was going to say years ago, that's how we operated. We went up there, and uh, we ended up with Will Keo as our as our guide because our I was I was one adult. We we needed a second. And it worked out extremely well, and we, we we did the Porkies, which was absolutely beautiful because you've got ancient forest there that's never been harvested. It's yes, cool. best case scenario is uh, you have one adult, and then you have to take me with you, and I get to go out for a week. <laughs> Sounds good. You're sitting there nodding and smiling. That's exactly what you were thinking. <laughs> Can read me your too. Face. I'm thinking the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, we're, uh, we're in the process of hiring our our trek guides for the summer, um, and we're we're making we're going to hope to get a mix of over twenty ones and over eighteens as well. Um, there's usually more eighteen and eighteen year olds and twenty one year olds are interested. We're also um, looking for trek guides who are uh, well for female trek guides, just so we can make sure to provide uh, female trek leadership um, and guiding experience to our uh, female troops as well. So. Yeah, so that's a great point. If you have um, over 18 year olds in your troop or that have recently left your troop that you think would be qualified or interested, we provide comprehensive training um, at the beginning of every summer that includes first aid training and uh, wilderness trek training. 
So, and the, we have the instructors that are qualified to do such. So if you have people that you think would be um, very strong leaders and be able to take on this immense responsibility, um, we would love to get in contact with them and uh, possibly provide an interview. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Rory, can you just go over the uh, how to sign up again for a Hyde Venture Trek program? Uh, yes. So there's a couple. I'm going to go back in my slides a little bit. Um, so review your Trek destinations and ask us questions. Uh, there is a Trek request form that I'll take all of the all the information that we need. Um, to be able to get your trek re reserved and get your um, permits pulled and your reservations made and all of that. Um, and that form really has everything that we need on it. So if you, I will drop a link in the chat for that. Yeah, so if you go makajwan.com slash high dash adventure slash register for the link that I'm about to send that'll take you directly to how to register for everything, the fees, what the group sizes are, and it's all in a table to make it even easier to read. Um, and this is also in the Trek planning guide, which is being reorganized to make it kind of a little bit easier to read than it has been in the past. Um, and this uh, registration page also has all the basic like higher level information that you would ever want. Um, about our about our tracking program as far as what we include links to the guides contact information phone numbers um, how to support us if you have any extra gear that you're looking to donate i'll be putting up a link to a wish list soon for that so yeah any other questions uh, I just want to go over again. Uh, we are, uh, like Rory mentioned, he's working directly with the uh, camping, American Camping Camp Association, and they're uh, working with the CDC and other groups to form a plan for COVID. Uh, we don't have any hard policies for our COVID operations yet uh, because we're still coming up with those policies. Uh, and we expect it to be quite fluid as we get closer. Uh, we want to know what what we're dealing with when we're dealing with it, we expect it to be a very different picture than the world we live in now. So we can't speculate at all on uh, what we will be doing to um, prevent the spread of COVID, but we will have precautions in place come this summer. Yeah, and it's, it's I'm, I'm writing up the policies and working with people from the, well, with the ACA, and it runs the gamut from camp as normal with masks and social distancing to camp in a bubble like if you were able to attend camp this past summer, um, either at the summit or at one of the other uh, regional camp or council camps that operated. Um, it'll either look close to that or close to camp or somewhere in the middle depending on what COVID looks like at the time. Um, it's where we've got a bunch of different options all like if A, then we'll do check in like B or like C or like D. So it's there's a whole lot of options in place and there's a lot of different variables that all factor into what does COVID look like right now? Like a month before camp opens or when camp opens. Yeah, and that'll also affect the visitation policies and everything else. So there's a lot of things that'll be impacted by it. Um, and I don't wanna start having different versions of stuff published out of saying, this is what we're doing 100%, no doubt. Um, because that could change in a month or two months or four months. Yeah. Cool. Good question. Any other questions out there about anything uh, Hydrant related or Macajuan related? All right. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm going to start. Recording now. Uh, but yeah, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, please tell your units about it. Tell your youth leaders about it. Tell your friends and other units about it. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I've I worked in high adventure for a while and I really, really love it. And now I get the opportunity to be back involved with it. And it's a lot of fun. Cool. 
Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. So as far as next steps, I'll be getting, I'll be summarizing out uh, this kind of all the links that we mentioned here. I'll <laughs> update the slides with the correct date, as I'm sure some of you noticed. Um, <laughs> and I'll include the slides as an attachment in a, in a thank you for attending email that I'll get emailed out to everybody who was here. Um, and then once I am able to edit the video and just make sure that the sound is good and video is good, that'll get posted up onto iHub and our council's YouTube channel. That's it. They're, they're optimistic. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Hi, Wolfie. Thank you all. Who's that?